uh, look at this prosperity thing. And it's important that as we see in verse 1, uh, verse 1 here of uh, Hosea chapter 9, rejoice not. Now we've seen last week how we are told to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord even more. And again I say rejoice. And it's uh, fitting that we need to rejoice in the Lord. There's no doubt about that. Throughout all of Scripture, we are to rejoice in the blessings of the Lord. And I'm sure that we can all attest, if we wanted to have a time of testimonies, we haven't had one of those for a long time, when we should do that, is to have a little testimony of how the Lord has been blessing you and um, in your life and, and uh, working in, in your life. But here we see in this beginning of this verse, it says, rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people. They're, they were rejoicing as other countries were rejoicing. And uh, the, there was a prosperity still in the land. And the Lord said, don't rejoice. You shouldn't be rejoicing. We need to obviously turn to him. But we're going to continue looking at this and, um, and continue to study God's word as we go. I think we're going to go down to uh, the end of verse 14. Um, this evening, we'll just take a few snippets, shots here. So, let's have a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll open God's Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here. We do praise you and thank you, Lord, that we can indeed rejoice in your blessings. And Father, we often sing that hymn, Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One. We often sing, There Shall Be Showers of Blessings. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for those hymns. We thank you, Father, that we can indeed rejoice. And we rejoice, first and foremost, in the salvation that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. In his uh, birth, his death, and his resurrection. The good news of the gospel. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, what a blessing it is to know you as Lord and Saviour. And Father, we want to praise you and thank you that you loved us so much. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for the salvation that's been purchased on the cross. A cruel and painful death. And yet, Father, we receive eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, we do pray now as we open your word that you would hide the speaker behind the cross. Father, that we would see ourselves as we take a look at ourselves this evening. And Father, it's all good and well to look at uh, the nation of Israel, these ten northern tribes. And Father, it's all very well for us to point the finger at them. But Father, let's also take a look at ourselves. And Father, we do pray that we may be praising you and thanking you in all things. And Father, that uh, if we are uh, stumbling and falling away from thee, Father, that we would not rejoice. But Father, that we would come uh, to a right relationship with you, that you would forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we do then pray that uh, as we open your word that you would shower us with your blessings. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so rejoice not, O Israel. So Israel was not to rejoice. And of course, we've already seen this, there's a bit of prosperity still going on in the nation. Still a bit of prosperity going on. There's still a harvesting going on. There's still bringing in the grapes, bringing in the figs, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. I'll just give you that one for free. Next time I'll charge you entry at the door. Um, but here we need to recognize the fact there is a blessing still happening and a joy for the nation of Israel. But God says, rejoice not. Rejoice not. And Israel was taking advantage of God's goodness. He was taking advantage of God's goodness. Do Christians take advantage of God's goodness? Do Christians take advantage of being saved and so that now we can do whatever we like? We're free. We're born and, and we've been set free from the law. Oh, happy condition, we sing that hymn. Now, I won't sing that to you because I didn't charge you at the door. But we have this freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ. And there are still restrictions. There are still some things that we need to be careful of. And they, these Christians, well, I'll call them Christians, these Christians, these these 
nation, this nation of Israel, the ten northern tribes, Ephraim, what they wanted was the best of both worlds. And often, and we'll look at this in a moment, there are Christians today, oh, I see what the problem is. And I, I can see it perfectly well here. But let's turn this on so you can see what's going on. There are Christians today who want the best of both worlds. They want the Christian life and they want the worldly life at the same time. They want the best of both worlds. The nation of Israel here wanted the best of both worlds. They wanted to, to be prosperous in the land. They wanted to have this, the, the reward upon every corn floor. Notice that at the end of this verse 1 in chapter 9. Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people, for thou hast gone a whoring from thy God. Thou hast loved the reward upon every corn floor. The floor and winepress shall not feed them. And we'll come to that in a moment. Oh, there we go. Okay, so Israel was taking advantage of God's goodness. And Christians today, and I'll put that in quotation marks, often take advantage of the good nature of Christians. People do this, in fact. Have you ever seen the, the people, I think it's mainly in town and in Rickerton, around the Rickerton Mall, or should I say Westfield Mall, um, I still call it Lancaster Park, by the way, I don't call it um, whatever they call it now, but what do they call it now? It's gone now, sorry. It's gone now, okay, right. Well, I still call it Lancaster Park, right? So, um, Around these areas, town and things, you have these beggars. You know, they're sitting on the ground, they're all poor, and they've got this little cardboard, you know, money, you know, they want looking for money, please feed me or whatever. And you notice what they've written on the bottom, in quotation marks, God bless. They're taking advantage of the goodness of Christianity. And there are people today who are in churches today who are taking advantage of Christianity today. They want the best of both worlds. The best of being saved and the best of the state of being unsaved. So they would come into the church, and we'll look at this in a moment, in a few slides time. But they want what they can get from Christianity. They want what they can get. The prosperity is a downfall. Now, I'm not saying we need to stay poor. I'm not saying anything like that. But we need to be careful that the prosperity, that what we've got, what the nation of Israel had, wasn't their, isn't our downfall as it was their downfall. So let's turn to Psalm 73. So keep a bookmark in uh, Hosea chapter 9 and go to Psalm, or the 73rd Psalm. In verse 3 and verse 12. Now put yourself as a Christian. Sitting in the church and we're looking at the world. You try, I oh know as Christians, we don't want the best of both worlds. We just want the best of God's world. We just want His best. We want to be showered with blessings. We want to have the joy, the joy of the Lord. But here, if we're looking at, a lot of people are looking at the world and saying, hey, here it is. I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The prosperity of the wicked. And as you drop down to verse 12, it says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. There are people today who want the best of both worlds. They want what God has got to offer. And yet they look at these verses and they say, Okay, I want what, what they, these people have got, what the wicked has. They want prosperity. So by the time you leave this place, I want to have a couple of million dollars so I can buy my fourth jet plane. All right? Jim. 
Or is it 54 million, is it? It's quite a lot of money, okay? Don't worry about the prosperity out there. I want to be prosperous in here, okay? Mortgage your house if you have to. Sell it if you have to. No. But that's what people were doing. They were looking in the world and seeing the prosperity in the world. The nation of Israel was looking in the world and seeing the prosperity of the world. The nation of Israel was looking at other countries and saying, oh, they had a king, we want a king too. We don't want God to rule over us, we want a man to rule over us. We want a king to rule over us. We want what the world has. And there are Christians today who are inside the church today wanting exactly what the world has or they want the best of both worlds. They want to be saved. They don't want to know or have that assurance that if they were to die today, that they would go to heaven. They want the assurance that uh, they are going to inherit heaven. So they want all those things. And then they look in the world and say, well, I want them to be as prosperous as I can, to have this prosperity that the wicked has. And in verse 12, they increase in riches. Why can't I? Why can't I? Prosperity. Increase in riches. Is that what we want? Is that what... That's what the nation of Israel wanted. They wanted the best of both worlds. They wanted to be able to worship their false gods and yet be blessed by God. Does that work? God doesn't want it. Go to Exodus chapter 20 and you'll find it. Ten commandments. But anyway, we're not going to go there. We're going to go back to Psalm 73 and look at verse 4. For there are no bands in their dead, but their strength is firm. Here are these people, these foolish people that have rejected God. You could say that they've rejected Christ. And these people who are Christians are looking at these people. And they're wicked, they're ungodly. And yet, there are no bands in their dead, and their strength is firm. There's no pain when they die. And here we've had Tabitha die, we've had other people die who are Christians, and yet they've died a painful death. Their body is strong. Their body is strong. And ours are weak. As we get older, we become more frail. And here we're sitting in the church and we're looking at the world and we're saying, hey, I want the best of both worlds. I don't want pain and suffering when I die. Their body is strong, but I'm weak, I'm sick, I'm in the church. People are saying I'm using the church as a crutch. Because I'm not well, mentally. I need something. So why not go to church? Drop down to next verse, verse 5. They're not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. These unsaved people, when you come into the church and you look out there and you're holding to the word of God and you're saying, well, they're not in trouble, but we're in trouble. As Christians, we're in trouble. There are many Christians today in other countries, not necessarily here in New Zealand, but being persecuted for their faith. But they're not persecuted. I want the best of both worlds. I want to be a Christian and not be persecuted. I want to be a Christian and not to take a stand for Christ because if I take a stand for Christ, if I name the Lord Jesus Christ as my Saviour, I might be persecuted. People might think bad of me. I don't want that. I want the best of both worlds. I want to be blessed by God and I want to be blessed by the world. I want to be blessed by God and I want the world to think well of me. I don't want any worries. I don't want any plagues. I don't want any trials. I don't want any tribulations. I want the best of both worlds. Well, I'm afraid there's either one world or the other. You cannot have the best of both worlds. You're either saved or you're unsaved. You can't be half saved. 
Verse 7. Their eyes stand out with fatness. No, they don't have some eye problem. What do they call that eye problem where they really... Eyes that are googly eyes? Pardon? Thyroid, yeah. Goiter. Okay, I don't know, I'm not a doctor. But I'm very patient, but I don't have any patience. Okay, verse 7. Then, they are, their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. I want that too. I want that too. They receive the best part. They're in the world. They receive the best part. And here I am, being a Christian. I take a stand back and I let others go first. And of course, the unsaved, they rush in and they grab everything that they want. They have more than their heart could wish for. This was the nation of Israel. This was this nation, this northern ten tribes. They were looking at the world and saying, we want that too. We want all those things. We want prosperity, just like the other nations have. We want an increase in riches. And which country doesn't want an increase in riches? And there's no filtering down, I'm sorry. The top will cream it all off. No pain. Their body is strong. No worries, no, not plagued. No trials, no tribulations. They receive the best part. They have more than heart could wish. And here I am sitting in church. I want the best of both worlds. I want the best of both worlds. This is what the nation was doing. We don't want to do that, do we? We don't want to do that. Not many people are shaking their head. No. We don't want that, do we? No, we don't. And we compare that with a true Christian. And here are these people. I'll put them in quotation marks. These Christians. These Christians. In verse 14. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. So if you are in this state, you see, if you are being plagued and chastened every morning, wouldn't you want all this? Hey, wouldn't you want all that? Nobody, nobody, wants, nobody wants to be plagued. Nobody wants to be chastened. Nobody's looking for a, <coughs> a persecution. Nobody's wanting that. I'm sure you're not want, looking for it. You don't have a sign on your back, persecute me. You know, like sometimes you put a, a sign on somebody's back, kick me. And all of a sudden you're walking along the street and somebody kicks you. No, we don't walk around with signs. We don't want persecution. We don't go looking for persecution. And yet there are many people who sit in the church who want the best of both worlds. They want the best of salvation or what God can offer and then the other foot firmly planted in the world. And I want it. I want prosperity. I want an increase in riches. And I want that fourth plane, jet plane. And I want this money. I want to be able to have five or ten cars in my garage. I want prosperity. You know, the world has it. Why can't I have it? Well, why can't I have it? Why can't I have it? If, if the Lord gives it to me, I can have it. It's a blessing. But don't fall in the trap of claiming those things simply because those people outside, outside the church, have it and bring it in. So we do need to be very, very careful. Let's go back to Psalm 73 and just, just tie it all together now. Verse, uh, well, let's pick it up in verse 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the forge. 
the fullness said in his heart. What is the full said in his heart? There is no God. And here, I was envious at the foolish, or the fool who says there is no God. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there is no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. There's no pain when they die. Their body is strong. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. So there's no trials, no tribulations. There doesn't seem anything. Everything seems to go fine. Everything seems to go fine. Therefore, pride, verse 6, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. In other words, if you're in this situation, you'd be like what they come and... Well, let's continue reading. If you're in this situation, you would say exactly what these people say. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They're corrupt. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, as people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them, and they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? I have everything I want. Why do I need God? Why do I need God? Behold, these are ungodly, who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood Mary. And of course their end is in verse 19, how they are brought into desolation in a moment. The moment they die and they open their eyes in hell, they are utterly consumed with terrors. Utterly consumed with terrors. Now, bringing it back to the nation of Israel. Of course, this is a Jew that's writing this, okay? Psalm of Asaph. And we see here that looking in the world can make us feel down. And when we have people, not necessarily in this church, but there are people in churches today who take advantage of the goodness of Christianity. They want the best of both worlds. The goodness of Christians versus the goodness that they can get from the world. And we have here a little sign, cardboard sign, sitting on the floor. You know, give me money, God bless. God bless. Some people make a profession of religion for the sake of worldly gain. They come into the church and they try and set up these things. We'll talk a little bit more. It says they calculate the benefits, the professional, political or social which they expect from religion. So if you wanted to, to um, stand for government or local government or something like that, you want to attract uh, a certain type of people, if you want a certain type of voter, you would join a church. You want the best of both worlds. You want these people to vote for you and then for you to stand in government or local government. A social standing. So you're standing and have a social standing that you are pure and wholesome and good. You name yourself as a Christian. They look to the church for outward advantages which they, they think to derive from it and they attach themselves to a denomination that they hope for the greatest gain. So they might go from church to church. They come in here and say, well, this is not a very big church. I'm not going to get much out of this church. I'm going to go to another church. So they go one round the corner. Okay? Oh, it's a bigger church. Still not quite enough. I think I want to involve myself in a church that has a thousand people. So I had to go around to Dickinson Street and walk into the church there. Just behind 89, number 89, Dickinson Street. Um, let's go just 
quickly go to those <coughs> passages in John chapter 2. <coughs> John chapter 2 and verse 16. I think we were here last week. We'll pick it up from verse 13 and we'll go down to verse 16. So John chapter 2, verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. They were taking advantage of the situation. Verse 15. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. And the sheep and the oxen and and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the table. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. They wanted the best of both worlds. They want to take advantage of the people there. They want to take advantage. You give me money and I'll give you a dove so that you can bring it to the church. We don't have a book sale, bookstore, or whatever. We have not this merchandise. We don't have this merchandise. We don't try and make money. These people are making money. Making money out of you. Making money out of you. You have a bookshop. You can call it a Christian bookshop if you like. But there's all sorts of doctrines in them. All sorts. It's not just KJV, fundamental, Baptist, centered books. It's everything is in there. They're making merchandise. Selling. Pictures of Christ. Crucifix. Whatever. Anything. And they're making merchandise. And here, Christ saying there should not be these people making merchandise of you. They shouldn't take advantage of Christianity. And there are many people who take advantage of Christians today. Second Peter. <clears throat> and here, the nation of Israel, we'll get back to Hosea soon, that the nation of, of um, Israel, the ten northern tribes, they wanted the best of both worlds. That was unacceptable to God. He did not accept. They didn't put him first place. They wanted God to bless them, and yet they also wanted uh, the, their gods, or actually, they, in fact, they attributed the blessing to their gods. Um, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. And through covetousness, Shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not? Even though these people might be in the church, and you might call them Christians, but they're seeking the best of both worlds. They're looking at what they can get out of you. There are many churches, many people who are in churches today who are looking to take that advantage. They involve themselves in such things as pyramid selling schemes, multi-level marketing. You know, they come in here and they say, oh, yes, we've got ladies here. Let's sell Avon. You all like makeup, don't you? Don't you? You use makeup, don't you? Yes, you do. Let me sell you some. They involve them in those sort of things. They see that in the, in the church today, they see these people. They say, ah, I can make money here. And the bigger the church or the more ladies you have in the church, the more money. Hey, I can, because it's a pyramid selling scheme, Maybe I can sign you guys up. So did you find your own clients? And then you buy from me 
so that you can sell to your clients, so that I can get rich. You see what's going on? This is happening in the churches today. They're taking advantage. They want the best of both worlds. Turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. Now, I don't want to just pick on, on um, Avon. Look, essential oils. All those sort of things. They're all pyramid selling schemes. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I call it essential oils because it's, you need it. It's essential that you have it. Six, but godliness with contentment is great gain. <clears throat> contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation, and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. Erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. They're in the church. They're in the church. And this, the love of money is the root of all evil. They've pierced themselves through. They've erred from the faith. Instead of focusing on God and, and serving the Lord, they're serving themselves and selling. And after the service, oh, praise the Lord, amen. Now unto him who's able to keep you, amen. Right, out we go. Hey, did you want some... Did you want some? How is your uh, cake decorating going? <laughs> <clears throat> One famous scheme, pyramid type scheme, is known as gifting scheme. Have you ever been to those gifting schemes that you have parties? You have, like Tupperware and things like that. So if you sell enough, uh, Tupperware, you get a gift, a gifting scheme. Uh, there are the, lots of these around. These often have names like dinner party, woman empowering woman, dinner club, circle of friends, or woman's empowerment, network, network. Have you noticed something? It's all to do with women, because they love to party, don't they? <laughs> Hey? You love parties, don't you? Party, party, party. You know that ad? You probably don't remember this ad. The party, party, party ad, and then the acne's pop out, remember? <laughs> That's for the teenagers, you see, they have the acne cream. <coughs> have you got some? You like? Oh, it's coming. It's coming. Don't you worry. It's coming. And probably, Lizzie will probably have them before you. <laughs> All right, but don't take hers. Just go and see an Avon lady. Um, so there are lots of these things, and we need to be careful. What is the house of the Lord for? Worship. Giving God the glory. Being instructed in His Word. Not for selling. Pyramid scheme in which new participants buy in with a set amount of money to buy products, so you have to buy in, you, you buy your products initially, and then you begin selling. Amway is another one. Another one. All these schemes. If you're in a church, there's people in here, they want cleaning products, don't they? You want to have a nice spick and span toilet, don't you? <laughs> hey, you don't want to sit on a grotty seat? So, opportunity, let's sell. You know, they say cleanliness is next to godliness, so you come to church for godliness and then you go and buy some stuff for cleanliness. <coughs> Products are purchased from the person who recruits them. They, in turn, are required to recruit more people. As you collect more recruits, 
you move more up the pyramid. He never gets to the top, though. <coughs> Israel attributed her spiritual prosperity to their gods. And they enjoyed worshipping their idols. Let's go to back to Hosea chapter 9. <coughs> Oh, this goes too fast in the evening. I wish you hadn't put that clock up there. Uh, <laughs> I tell you what, it's very warm in here. Jason's sweating, I can see that. He's really hot. I'm really warm. I almost think about taking my jacket off. And I hear that thing is still going. Is it? I hear a fan going. Oh, is it that, that thing up there? Oh, okay. And I'm very, very warm. Okay. <clears throat> Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people, other people looking on the fence, saying, look at their prosperity. I want what they have. For thou hast gone whoring from thy God. Thou hast loved a reward upon every cornflower. Don't we love that? We want to be blessed. We want to be blessed. It was her idols that she thanked for any season of plenty that she was favoured with. She loved the reward of every corn form. Religion for what she could get out of her idols. People go into the churches today. What can they get out of church? What can they get out of church? What can they get to satisfy the flesh? Oh, I'm not joining this church. The music's so dull and boring. I'm not joining this church. All they do is preach the Bible. I'm not joining this church. There's no drums. There's no strobe lights. I'm leaving your church. It's not my church. So I just go through some points here as we finish this evening. <clears throat> the ungodly man has no rational grounds for gladness or rejoicing. They can't, there's no eternal, we've already seen in Psalm 73, there's no eternal joy for a person who is unsaved. What do they have their joy in? Well, in the things that they can get. And if they happen to be born poor and they stay poor, where is their joy? Unless they have Christ, there is no joy. These poor people that sit on the streets with their begging signs, there is no joy. Where is their joy? They say, God bless, but they're not saved. It doesn't make sense to them for a Christian to rejoice in the Lord all way. And again, I say rejoice. It doesn't make sense to them. How can you rejoice in the Lord if you're poor? We know. We have the promises from God's word. Secondly, our harvest of joy should be joy before God. Okay? Before God. And, and we see in verses 1 and 2 here, the, the floor and the winepress shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. There should be a joy... But there is no joy. Because they fail God. Don't fail God. Work for the night is coming. Serve the Lord with all your being. Love him with all that you have. If neglecting the joy we have in the Lord, there is often a, a change, a danger to a Christian's personal relationship that they have with God. If you neglect and enjoy, then the relationship between you and the Lord suffers. Because God wants you to be happy. What's stopping you from having a joy? Here we see in verse 1, chapter 9, that the, they were not to rejoice. They were to stop rejoicing because they went abhorring from their God. There was loss of blessings, verses 3 and 4. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim 
shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. Unclean. It's like the prodigal son. Want his adherents now, not later, now. And he ended up in cleaning out the pig pens. Verse 4, they shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing unto him. So even if they did offer, because of the state that they were in, God wouldn't accept them. Their sacrifice shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. All that eat thereof shall be polluted, for their bread, for their soul shall not come into the house of the Lord. Fourth point, it is craziness. Craziness. To banish all thought of solemn days, of life, giving yourself up to habits of trivia and worldly pleasures. Giving yourself up and looking at the world and saying, well, I want what the world has. It's craziness to, to throw away everything that's Christian and say, I want what the world has. Verse 5. What will ye do in the solemn day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What, what was God expecting them to do at a feast day and a solemn day? Say a day of Pentecost. What did he expect them to do? To worship God. What does he expect people to do on a Sunday? Worship God. That's what he expects. What will you do? What will you do? We must be aware of false prophets and try the spirits whether they are of God. Verses 7 and 8. The days of visitation are come. The days of uh, recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad for the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred. We have to have the sense of knowing, looking out for sheep and wolves clothing. No. Wolves and sheep's clothing. You've got it around the right way. The watchman of Ephraim was with my God. But the prophet is a sneer and a fowler in his days, in his ways, and hatred in the house of his God. Finally, <clears throat> the Lord's land is only for the Lord's people. Lord Jesus prepares a place for us in the heavenly, not on the earth. I go away and prepare a place for for you, that where I am, there ye may be also. So what is this world all about? For the Christian, serving him, promoting the gospel. Go out into all the world and preach the gospel. That's what it's all about. It's not about looking at the world and saying, oh, look how prosperous they are. I want what they've got. Not being a Christian and say, oh, I can take advantage of these people and sell them Avon or Amway or whatever. That's not, no. That's not what it's about. The Christian life is simply to serve Him with all your body and all your might. And after all, isn't that what our Hymn of the Month is all about? Lord, I want a revival. Revival starts with me. Revival doesn't start with unbelievers. How will they hear the gospel without a preacher? Start a revival in me. Promote the gospel. Preach. Teach. Salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's close with it. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for what we see. The errors of the people. Your people, Lord. And yet things haven't really changed that much. Father, man is drawn to other gods. Maybe the god of money. And Father, there are many who 
take advantage, we see that the Lord Jesus Christ cast out the money changers from the temple. Father, your house is a house of prayer, a time of worship. And Father, we have been bought with a price. We are no longer our own. And yet, many, many Christians, Father, would hang on to the world and say, I want to be my own boss. You can't boss me around, God. I want what the world has got. Look at their prosperity. Look at their health. Look at their fatness. Father, we do praise you and thank you that through your word you tell us that this life, as we've seen this morning, is dissolving. And we have something which is prepared for us, which is far, far greater. And so, Father, we do pray that we would not be looking at the world. We would not be desirous of what the world has. And Father, here we see the nation of Israel who are worshipping other gods. The God of fertility. Father, making their land fertile and their corn presses were full and overflowing. Father, it was their downfall. They did not give you the glory. Father, we do pray that we would be careful as Christians, as the bride of Christ. Father, those that have been redeemed with the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Father, we do thank you that we have been purchased, and that's what we want to focus on, not the world. It's not where we've come from, but where we're going. We give you praise, we give you honour, and we thank you, Lord. Lead and guide us through thy Holy Spirit. Challenge us, Lord. If we need challenging, hold us back. Father, even chasten us. If chastening is necessary, if we need to be have a change in direction, Father, we do pray that we would be sensitive to your leading. Not to be sensitive to the world's leading. Not to be sensitive to the world's desires. Father, that we would not be like Eve looking at the fruit and saying, it is beautiful, it is desirous, I want it. Father, we would indeed be obedient to you. We do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs>